I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I'm situated is traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. As a settler, I'm grateful to currently share this land with these communities who have lived in harmony with the land for thousands of years before me. I also acknowledge my role in the colonial system that continues to oppress these Indigenous peoples, and I hope that today's event will aid us all to take a step forward in reconciling our relationships with Indigenous peoples. We hope to start to dismantle the oppressive and colonial practices that continue to hurt Indigenous peoples through today's event. I hope that today's discussion and topics implore you, all of you to acknowledge your role in the continuation of these practices, to further educate yourselves, and to take a step forward to genuinely reconcile your relationship with Indigenous peoples. Please take a moment to talk about some of the things you are grateful for that have been enabled by the land you're situated on and acknowledge the proper Indigenous territory that you are on in the live chat. We understand that the conversations that will be had today may be difficult, and as a result, we have a trigger booth should you need to step out. The link for this can be found in the YouTube description of this live event. As well, transcripts for our speakers today can be found on our program, whose link is also in the description of this live event and on our Facebook page. We are excited to debut our fall event today. As some of you may remember, TEDx Quincy hosts an annual open mic night around this time at Clark Hall Club. Our team is dedicated to the TED mantra of ideas worth spreading, and we've created this virtual event to adapt to these new times. The Web is an event that has been planned for over three months now. The ongoing pandemic escalated racial and gender tensions around the world, especially here in Canada. The interconnection between the ongoing pandemic and the discrimination and violence against the LGBTQ plus and BIPOC communities is what formed the basis for the theme of our event today. Each issue, although unique on its own, is somehow connected to each other. As a society, we are experiencing instrumental change largely because more people are listening and learning. Through consultation with student groups, faculty members, and graduate students, we have realized that TEDx Queen Zio gets people to do just that to listen and learn. So what better way could we contribute than to offer our large platform to the diverse voices of the LGBTQ plus and BIPOC communities? So here we are. It would be impossible to ignore the urgency to uplift the voices of these affected communities. It would be equally impossible to ignore your presence as an audience. Thank you for coming and agreeing to hear our panelists and speakers talk. We hope that you enjoy the web and appreciate the richness and diversity of the QT BIPOC community. Hello everyone, my name is Brianna Dudemain. I'm a third year commerce student and currently the co-chair of Q+. Clearly I'm white, but I am not as clearly a queer and non-binary person. I introduce myself like that because in recognizing that I am straight passing and present in a very feminine way, I reap some of the privileges of a straight white woman would until I disclose my identity. That being said, I've always had an interest in social justice work at an institutional level. Questions that have often crossed my mind are how to develop and implement policies within organizations to create equitable spaces where people feel like they belong. However, this motivation to do such work is only demonstrating allyship in one dimension. Allyship is multifaceted and looks differently depending on who you're working with, your relationship to them, and what actions you're taking to combat racism, queerphobia, and other types of oppression. The groups that I've found where acts of allyship shift drastically, especially for university students, are personal relationships, professional environments, and academic environments. Firstly, when it comes to personal relationships, I realize your interactions differ based on how closely you are with your friends. Nonetheless, whether you're best friends or see each other twice a year, this is an area that I believe to be one of the most ambiguous in determining how to be an active ally. However, there are some key experiences that have shaped how I approach allyship, which I'd like to share. 
Number one, being open and honest with your friends and having a conversation about your journey towards becoming an active ally is the first place to start. Explaining your intentions when it comes to race-related or queer-related education signals that you're learning and will make mistakes. It is important in this conversation that you tell your friends you don't expect them to educate you or stay calm when you make a mistake. Although having this talk doesn't make it any easier for your QT BIPOC friends to be victims of your microaggressions, it signals to your friend that you care and want to do better despite the many bumps you will encounter along the way. After this conversation, it is your job to make sure to check in with your friends about the impact you're having on them and determine if they feel supported by you. Another thing that's important for white people to understand is you can't be everything your BIPOC friend needs, especially during times of race-related tragedy. Specifically, when your friend comes to you with a race-related issue, it's your job to listen. And most of the time, only listen. Make sure before you try and console your friend, you ask. It's important to do that because your lived experience is much different than a member of the BIPOC communities. Therefore, you can't really do much consoling if you don't fully understand what it's like to feel the way they do. Instead, what I recommend is to share mental health resources and specific opportunities your friend can, em can employ when they feel alone. It's also important that you don't force your friend to talk, even if you think getting things out in the open makes everything better. Finally, recognize that you don't have to stay silent all the time, but rather just be conscious of the space you take up in conversations and determine when the best time to engage is. Finally, in these relationships, it's most important to make sure you correct any mistakes you make right away and apologize profusely with no questions asked. And don't mention your intentions after the fact. It really only makes things worse and puts the onus on your BIPOC friend. This is a huge commitment to make and one that's necessary if you want to have people of color in your life. Everything is optional. So if you're going to be friends with someone whose lived experience is different than yours, it's important to know that this relationship will require extra effort than a relationship with someone who's in the same as you on dimensions of race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and others. This effort looks like reading books about race or listening to podcasts, and the list doesn't end there. A book that has particularly helped me is So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Oluo. It is important that you don't only read resources, but you also reflect on how the information presented is relevant in your relationship and life. For example, in this book, Oluo discusses how trying to get in with your Black friends or gain acceptance by them shouldn't be your goal when being an ally. What really is important is starting race-related dialogue with your white friend groups and speaking up when something racist is said. Something that I've started to do is discuss the contents of this book and the podcast I listen to with my family. Although it can get kind of sticky at times, this is a very powerful way of demonstrating an act of allyship. Moving on to professional spaces, I find this space to be less difficult to navigate, only because there are very established norms that inform how to speak and what to do when you're in these spaces. Some describe this as a respectability politics. Others describe it as the way things go. But nonetheless, it exists, and it makes it extremely challenging for QT BIPOC folks to stand up for themselves in moments where they're victims of violence and oppression. Therefore, in these contexts, it is most important for white, heterosexual, or cisgendered individuals to speak up against these acts. Speaking up can, can come in many forms. The first recommendation I have is to call people in. Yes, call them in, not out. By calling someone in, you're taking on the burden of educating that person so a member of the QT BIPOC community doesn't have to put in the emotional labor to do that. A way in which you can call people in is by setting up a quick meeting where you're able to see the person's face, so via Zoom or in person, discussing whatever action was problematic. 
Although this may seem daunting, by sharing the knowledge you know with someone else, you're giving them a chance to learn rather than be socially rejected for their past mistakes. In some cases, people should be called out, but as an ally, it's your responsibility to ensure you're not speaking on behalf of any group when you call someone out. Another way to signal allyship in the workplace is by participating and being an active member on any diversity committees within your company. You should also try to seek out opportunities to help develop policy aimed at including underrepresenting employees. Although you may feel at a place in these settings, think about a person of color in white space all day. Then reconsider how uncomfortable a one hour diversity committee meeting might be. By showing up, you're showing support. Giving up time in your busy schedule to prioritize someone else's well-being and professional success is the foundation of allyship and can be a significant step towards becoming an ally to your colleagues. Be mindful not to take up too much space at any of these events. Manage the situation or even take over a conversation because your responsibility as an ally is to create space for another community, not take it up. When considering your academic life, it is critical to understand your circle of control, circle of influence, and circle of concern. By understanding this, you will be better able to figure out where you can be an ally and how. Your circle of control is characterized as being the areas of your life which you directly manage and can change. By considering your circle of control, such as the clubs you're a part of, the events you attend, the types of initiatives you support on campus, and the courses you take, you can be more informed about how to be an ally. Therefore, if you want to be an ally, consider joining clubs that have diverse executive teams and ensure that EDII is one of their core values. Events that target allies are an opportunity not only to show up for a community, but also learn how you can show continued support past the event. Finally, consider taking at least one course on topics related to the QT BIPOC community. To teach you more about the ways colonialism, white supremacy, and queer phobia have created a system of oppression that benefits white, cisgendered, straight people. This is especially useful if you're a student leader who manages or leads any organizations on campus. Moving on to your circle of influence, this includes any areas in which you can recommend or make suggestions, but can't directly change yourself. Therefore, as a student, you can make recommendations to a professor. As a student leader, you can influence your club's decisions. And as an influencer, you should be able to have difficult conversations advocating for the QT BIPOC community. These areas are very important to focus on because they are likely having the most impact on you and your peers. Within this circle, you can make suggestions to your professors to include more diverse course content written by underrepresented authors. And if you're a co-chair on a club, make sure you refer to an EDII framework to help you make more inclusive decisions that can reach everyone. Finally, within your circle of concern, you should be considering the administration of your program, the company you choose to work for, and other areas of your life that you cannot control or influence, but concern you in some ways. In order to be an ally towards the QT BIPOC community, it is important to highlight or share any injustices you see happening within these groups. It is critical that although you can't really change these structures directly or even influence them that heavily, you draw attention to, report, and share information that can help underrepresented communities navigate these spaces better. On behalf of Q Plus and myself, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at TEDx. This conversation about allyship does not end here. There are so many other areas of your life that are affected by allyship. For example, social media is one of them that we didn't get a chance to talk about, but you should consider and apply the principles I discussed today in all aspects of your life. Thank you.
Hi there, my name is Jenna, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Queen's Collage Collectives, also known as QCC. So to introduce myself, I'm in my fourth year, I'm minoring in, I'm majoring in Gender Studies and minoring in Indigenous Studies. I'm also in Concurrent Education, and I hope to teach grades K-6. to um, I'm heavily involved in student activism on campus. This is through QCC and also through groups such as Lavana Gender Advocacy Center and the Education on Queer Issues Project. Um, so to go into QCC, um, we're a club on um, Queen's campus. We started in September 2018. Our events are for healing expression and the strengthening of mental health through creating art. Um, when you come to our events, we aim to provide a mechanical space to facilitate anti-oppressive conversation. Um, we do monthly events uh, that are consistent and have a specific theme. And then we also do collaborative events with other groups on campus for other themes. Um, our club uh, funds go towards making our events barrier-free and accessible to as many as possible. And we also redistribute funds towards groups that do direct action for anti-oppressive anti-oppression. So these have included in the past various black-led organizations, Sexual Assault Center Kingston, and the Kingston Binary Exchange Project. So um, why does QCC have an anti-oppressive mandate? Uh, what is oppression? So oppression is the use of power and in institutions to marginalize, silence, and or dominate a group based on structures of power. So when you think of structures of power, try to think of the isms, such as racism, anti-black racism, settler colonialism, anti-indigenous racism, ableism, transphobia, also known as success, cis sexism, um, queer phobia, which is also known as homophobia, classism, colorism, ageism, sexism, and I probably missed a few, so try to think of ones that I might have missed. Um, QCC recognizes that all these structures of power are interconnected and they're actually dependent on one another. So we recognize when founding this club that not many groups on campus have been able to recognize this. Uh, so we try to use this lens to make sure that we're including groups of folks that are marginalized by more than one structure of power. Um, so for example, if your group focuses heavily on environmentalism, um, you need to make sure that you're centering and uplifting the voices of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, also known as BIPOC. Um, because they are the most targeted by and do the most work against pollution and environmental racism. Another example could be if you're a club that discusses women's empowerment, are you highlighting the voices of BIPOC women? Um, what about trans women? What about BIPOC trans women? Um, those that have multiple identities are often left out of single issue conversations, and that's something that um, QCC tries to combat and provide a space for. So we choose specific topics that are important to continue discussing, no matter if they're trendy or a hot topic. Um, it's the reality at Queen's um, before, during, and after student experiences of racism and other oppressions were shared on the student-run accounts called at Stolen by Smith and at Erased by FEAS, that um, these conversations need to be had and need to be expanded upon. The topics we choose always discuss one or more form of oppression, and we also run events that are exclusive and safer spaces for folks of only a specific identity to participate in. So for example, we've been doing Black-only space events with other clubs on campus, such as QBAS, which is Queen's Black Academic Society, and AXA, which is the African and Caribbean Students Association. And this provides black students at Queen's with a sense of belonging and community that is often hard to find in a space such as Queen's that normalizes whiteness and other normalized identities. Speaking specifically from my perspective as a white settler, um, there's definitely a lot of room in general and specifically at Queen's to work to support black, indigenous, and people of color and engage in productive and accountable conversations without taking up space from students who are black, indigenous, and people of color. Uh, with white supremacy, racism, and specifically anti-black racism and anti-indigenous racism, it's on white people to educate ourselves and also to have conversations with other white folks um, while also contributing to direct action against oppression with the power, privilege, wealth, skills, and other abilities that we personally possess. So we often get the question of how do I collage um, at our events? So I'll, I'll go through that quickly. Um, 
just so you know. And then if you attend an event, then you already know what's going on. Um, so the first step is get together some images. You can use some magazines or one of our collage kits, which is a single sheet of selected images put together by QCC. Um, and then step two, get together other materials, glue, scissors, stickers, glare, or whatever. Um, you can also bypass both of these steps if you do it um, on your device, um, which is a pretty easy way to do it as well. Um, and then number three is pick a theme. You can pick a feeling, a color palette, a specific issue, or you can consciously not choose anything and just make it very random. Um, and then just start cutting and gluing. It's pretty intuitive and you don't need any previous art experience. I didn't have any. Um, and you also don't need any skill, any specific skills or a specific eye for art. Um, as you can see behind me, the collages are very diverse in what ends up coming onto the page. And there's no right or wrong way to do a collage. It's just personal and very in the moment. So if you're really interested in seeing the type of events that we've put on for QCC in the past, you can go onto our Facebook and look at our past events. Um, but I'm just going to talk about a few that we had pre-COVID um, that were like important in defining of our club. So one that we had was an event um, in solidarity with the Wet Sew It In Land Defenders. So we had first a teach-in and then a discussion with folks that attended. And then we created collages that were put towards the creation of a banner in solidarity with the Wet Sewed and Land Defenders. Um, we've had uh, queer and trans pride events, um, such as Queens But Make It Queer. Um, and during that event, it was the same um, sort of layout of the discussion and then collaging. And then we used the collages to decorate for the annual queer prom that was held last um, year. We've also held once multiple anti-racism centered events, um, such as anti-racism like teaching, a black history event, and anti-racism from your unique positionality. Um, now moving forward with COVID, we've been doing virtual programming. So in August, we had a series of five anti-racist anti collaging events. Um, our first one was a black only kickback discussion and viewing party. Our second one was accountability 101. Our third one was connecting the dots between various liberation movements. The fourth one was building your allyship guide. And the fifth one was imagining a future beyond policing. Um, that's where we brought in speaker Pascal de Verlis, who is a co-founder of Black Lives Toronto, Black Lives Matter Toronto. And we had a very productive conversation. So for upcoming events, we're going to be hosting more virtual events. Um, this year during the school year, we're going to have monthly events open to join over Zoom. So the collage kits will be available online for you to print. And if you don't have access to a printer, we'll be working to make sure all folks have access to the necessary materials to participate. Um, these events are going to be specifically centered around anti-racism and specific topics that address our current realities and um, resistance to white supremacy and settler colonialism in Turtle Island, or uh, what is now called Canada. We're also going to be having upcoming collaborations with other groups, such as, for example, we have an upcoming Black-only event in collaborations with Queen's Black Academic Society to collage, discuss, and watch the Savage, Savage X Fenty fashion show. If you're looking to get in contact with QCC, um, you can email us at qcc at clubs.queensu.ca. Um, so if you're looking to do a collaboration with a group that you belong to, or if you're looking to get in touch with me person personally about anything I've discussed today, you can use the email for that. If you want to stay up to date on our events or see the collages created by those who attend our events, you can like us on Facebook and give us a follow at Queen's Collage Collectives. Thank you so much. A distinction that is often overlooked is that of equity versus equality. Sure, in general terms, most people understand the definitions of these words, but what do they mean when executed? What do they signify as ideals? The distinction between equality and equity is paramount in addressing the systemic barriers rooted in our society's foundation. Equality, as we know, is when all individuals are considered equal. However, this can never be true in practice given humanity's unjust past. 
the institutions that our society has been founded on are not inherently equal. Prejudice runs deep. Take, for instance, the police force, which in some states began as a system to return runaway slaves. Since those times, the root of the policing system has yet to change its intentions drastically. This is seen through the incarceration system, wherein people of color are overrepresented due to the law enforcement's racist foundations. Our founding institution's failures to treat individuals as equals ensures that we as a society cannot do so. For our society to be truly equal, there cannot be any biases or prejudices. These biases come about due to differentiating factors that can be used to single out individuals and divide them into groups. Differentiating factors are inevitable. Every individual has a different set of DNA. Phenotypically, it is impossible for us all to be equal. Given physical differences throughout history, we have distinguished individuals based upon these factors. Today, our mindsets may be different, but we are still a result of the environment in which we are brought up. The foundations of modern society are unjust, and thus those ideals are unconscious, unconscious within us, whether we comply with them or not. This will continue unless we teach future generations to adopt a new approach that addresses, that addresses foundational issues. Before we can address the aforementioned issues directly, we must evaluate an equitable approach. Equity is a distribution based on need, an execution of justice and fairness. Instead of preaching equality, we should be employing equitable solutions to problems. Let me paint you a picture that you may or may not have seen on Instagram. Three people are trying to look over a five foot, five inch tall wooden fence. Anna is five one, Jamie is 5'4", and Steve is 6'2". Right off the bat, Steve can clearly see over the fence. Jamie can just see over the fence if he cranes his neck, and Anna cannot see over the fence. An equal solution would be to give everyone a six inch stool so they can see. The issue with this solution is that it allows all three individuals to see over the fence, but it does not address the inherent problem. An equitable solution would be to give each individual the unique support that they need to see over the fence. Anna would get a six inch stool and Jamie would get a three inch stool. This solution addresses the individuals equitably to ensure they are all obtaining what they need to see over the fence. That is the benefit and distinction of equity compared to equality. Equity addresses individuals, whereas equality focuses on an overarching solution, hoping it will cover all of its bases. Now that this distinction has been made, let us go back to the concept of generational change. Ideal solutions to many instances of injustice lie within the restructuring of foundational issues, as mentioned prior. Given our example above, a true solution would be to change the wooden fence to a chain link fence. By addressing the systemic barrier, no support needs to be provided for each individual. However, this is not always attainable instantaneously, which is where generational change comes in. We may not be able to address issues that have been created over generations, and they may take generations to destroy, but we can create change by reevaluating our mindsets and applying equitable solutions. In situations of injustice, it is crucial to consider the root of the problem and address it directly, as opposed to creating simpler seeming solutions. The direct solutions cannot be obtained without an understanding and implementation of equity. By adopting an equitable mindset in lieu of an equal one, we appreciate differences instead of suppressing them. We are not all born with the same privileges, but what we do with those privileges to fight against systemic injustice is what matters. So then what can you do as someone with privilege? How can you help? Well, I would say that the first and most important thing an individual with privilege can do is listen. Listen to the experiences of your BIPOC friends, the things they've endured. The next thing would be asking questions. Education and awareness are essential to challenging the issues regarding racism and discrimination. Question everything you've been taught in the way it has been taught to you, the validity of what you're learning and the sources you're learning it from. After listening and questioning, reframe your mindset to adopt an equitable approach. Instead of being a social justice warrior by fighting for equality, actively employ an equitable mindset to consider where BIPOC individuals stand in any given situation. Actively noting the factors that contribute to privilege is essential in order to reframe your mindset to consider the circumstances of others.
Hello everyone. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to be here today. My name is Julius Adu and I'm a first year student in the Commerce Program and I'm the Operations Director on the Smith Black Business Association. I'd like to special, give a special shout out and thank you to TEDx Queens U for inviting me to speak to you guys today. I'm going to talk about allyship and what an effective ally is to me because by no means am I an expert on these topics and I'm always learning and always growing and open to new ideas and open to new perspectives. But for me personally, over this time, what I've realized is I've had to make a real distinction between sympathizing with others and empathizing with others. And what I mean by that is I've noticed a lot of people try to struggle with you versus opposed to struggling for you. The example I normally use to like explain this is swimming so a little bit about me i cannot swim like horrible like put me in the water i'll drown like it's not good like i should probably take lessons but that's not the point the point is like for me when i go to the beach or anything like i avoid the water because i know like that's not it's not a good recipe like it's a recipe for disaster like nothing good comes out of me going into the water so a lot of people, let's say you were to see someone drowning in the water. Would you hop into the water, see their, see them drowning, and start trying to swim beside them? I don't think many people would do that. You would go get a lifeguard because they are actually trained to assist these people. And I think that's right there a difference. Instead of trying to struggle with the person drowning, you go and have your own personal struggle. You're on the land, at the beach, searching for the lifeguard. And I think what I've realized is a lot of people reached out to me and said, I don't know what it is, the, the, the different things you go through, but I'm here for you. So we got to understand you can sympathize with people and empathize with people, but we need to know the difference. For me, if I'm in the water and I'm somehow, let's say I end up in the water and I'm swimming or lack thereof swimming and I start drowning, I wouldn't want someone to jump into the water and swim beside me because that's not really doing anything for me or that individual. That's them really trying to struggle with me, quote unquote. And I think we need people struggling for us. You don't necessarily need whatever marginalized group, whether it's black students, indigenous students, LGBTQ and so on, any QT BIPOC student, you don't need to struggle with them essentially. You need to be struggling for them. Regardless if they're present there or not, that 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 act of struggle and that act of allyship should always persist. I think me, let's say using my swimming analogy, if I'm swimming and I'm drowning, you wouldn't want someone to come struggle beside you. You want someone to go struggle for you and get you help and be able to get you out of that situation. And I think that's something I've realized personally. Like I cannot, as much as I try to understand what others are going through, I'll personally never be able to understand it. So as much as I want to sympathize and empathize with them, how much good am I doing? Is it doing more good than harm? Am I being that person that's seeing someone drowning in the water and just swimming beside them? Or do I want to go struggle for them and help them in a way that's actually meaningful and it's going to impact them and get them out of their difficult times and get them out of that difficult situation? So what I would say is to be an effective ally. You don't necessarily need to be struggling with the people. You don't need to necessarily be going out of your way to go into the quote unquote water and swim beside them. If you can swim them to shore and you are a lifeguard, by all means, go ahead. But really, really think critically about what you wish to accomplish and how you're going about what you're trying to accomplish. For me, I had to reevaluate my whole whole entire approach into being inclusive to others, not just black students or, or just any person of color, or any marginalized students. I had to really change my approach because I oftentimes was being that quote unquote swim beside someone struggling with them. But how can I struggle with you? And I don't know the pain you're feeling. Even if you come to swim beside me in the water, you know what it means to swim. Like you're gonna be okay. I'm still gonna be end up drowning. And I think that's something I've had to realize personally. I can't just struggle with people. I need to really go out of my way, struggle for them to really help them get them out of their situation. So that's like the little analogy I always love to use.
to explain me personally what I've come to understand and yeah thank you guys so much really we need to we need to get understand those differences and i think once we understand those different things it'll be it'll be it'll be very very helpful for everyone so thank you guys so much for having me today i hope this was great I'm not gonna go on too long with too many examples too many analogies because i'll ramble forever but thank you guys so much hope you guys have an amazing day I'm a first generation Canadian and I would like to discuss and reflect together how we can better approach conversations about race and marginalization. My family moved to Vancouver when I was very young and I grew up with a lot of books. I would read all sorts of stories, mostly fiction, and a common theme within these stories was that the characters all had light skin, light eyes, and light hair. I remember also spending many hours drawing as a kid, and I would center these poorly drawn artworks around girls in flower fields with pretty dresses on. And these girls would have blonde hair and blue eyes, just like the protagonists in the books I would read. I would almost never draw girls that looked like myself, and if they did, they would be in the background. I think this demonstrates how, as an impressionable kid, I was absorbing and mirroring the underrepresentation of Asians in media. East Asians are one of the most prominent minority groups in Canada, but growing up, I felt like people who looked like me were portrayed as side characters, if at all, with exaggerated accents for comedic relief. And this created a narrative where I believed that people who looked like me didn't really have a place in important roles. And I would spend many years trying to fit in. In elementary school, I would always sincerely hoped that my mom would pack a sandwich instead of fried rice or Asian noodles because I didn't want to be made fun of for eating cultural foods. Um, I would spend lots of time being well-spoken in English so that nobody would make fun of me for an accent. And you know, I remember telling my white friends from university about these internalized struggles I had, and they were shocked. One of them admitted thinking that I was an international student who didn't speak English because I was initially quiet when we met. They expressed grief and guilt and immediately went on to talk about how they've never made anyone uncomfortable about their cultural or ethnic identity and that they've always been kind and virtuous people their whole lives. Although this was well-intentioned, I found that they were just trying to defend themselves and trying to center the conversation on themselves without listening, which brings me to performative allyship. To be a performative ally is to s express support for a cause in order to better one's reputation, but not really speaking out from a place of authenticity. And you may have seen this recently in light of the Black Lives Matter movement of someone maybe using posts, gestures, or words of support to express solidarity for the purpose of maybe avoiding scrutiny um, and not really doing anything action-based to help the movement. And you might say, hold on, let's, let's go back to the university friends and how they didn't know any better. I would agree with that. Um, if I had spent my whole life seeing people from my community being represented in the spotlight, in TV shows, in Forbes magazine. If I had conversations centered around people who looked like me and their successes and their problems, I too would probably be shocked if someone told me that their experience was very different. And 
I would feel sorry for them if they told me that they never got to celebrate their ethnic or cultural identity in the same way that I did. If I only ever saw stereotypical portrayals of others who didn't fit the same mold as I did, as outsiders who were less fortunate, less eloquent, I too would probably believe that to be the truth as well. And I understand why my friends at the time jumped to clear their name. It really can feel like someone is accusing you of being a bad person in these types of dialogues. But to be an effective ally, one needs to acknowledge that we're not perfect and we may not always be coming from the most informed place. And so let's detach from the mentality that just because you consider yourself to be a good person doesn't mean that you're immune to making mistakes that could possibly hurt somebody. Racial bias is something that affects everyone. Um, according to Stanford psychology studies led by Dr. Eberhardt, we can be primed from our environment to associate certain things, such as violence or poverty, with certain races, and this is called implicit racial bias. The studies are also used to explore how these racial biases can be dangerous when triggered in scenarios that make us feel threatened. And as Dr. Eberhardt said, you don't have to be a bigot to be biased. Um, a common response I've noticed when my Asian peers speak about their families currently in or from Asia is the divergence towards the topic about the tragedies happening in Asia. And of course, there are places in Asia that are plagued with catastrophes, but to fixate on a negative narrative without considering the rich culture, the extensive history, the innovation in the cities, and the natural beauty and wildlife in the forests in these areas leads to a skewed perspective that unfortunately creates encouragement for negative stereotypes. So how do we approach these biases? How can we be effective allies instead of performative ones? Well, you can donate, you can show up for the groundwork, but the easiest way we can all continually learn is to listen. Listen to how we can be better towards one another. Take the time out of your day to read what your colored friends have to say about marginalization. Watch that video they recommended. You know, uh, go listen to that podcast that they like. Seek out seminars and workshops even to further your own education. And sometimes being an ally means having that conversation with someone you know who is maybe doing something harmful towards minorities. And it's not easy. Most importantly, if you are to take away anything, it's to listen to people without talking over them. And some of us might be thinking, I hardly have time in my busy day to listen to myself. And... I get it. And also in general, it, sometimes it's daunting to think about carving out time for new tasks or for heavy topics that we may not be ready to talk about. But, you know, in a sense, doing something like this is not too far off than what you've probably already been doing. You learn about what your friends would like to do next year, what they were annoyed by this past weekend what they're allergic to even. And in the same way, listening to people talk about race and experiences about identity and giving them the space to talk about these topics in the same way that they can talk about their dreams and aspirations is meaningful. Um, doing so makes you a better friend, but also probably a more informed person. And lastly, personally, I would say, despite everything, I had a good childhood. I recognize that my story, although relatable to a lot of Asians growing up in North America, is not representative of all experiences. 
And some people have definitely had it worse than I've ever had. And it's important to make space for their stories to be heard. I hope that we can extend our compassion to people who tell stories of pain, but also broaden our scope with stories of enriching cultures and different identities. It is this continual learning from each other that brings experiences to light and brings people together. Hi TEDx Queens U, my name is Akriti Kapoor and I conduct research in anti-racism studies in the Faculty of Education. Um, I want to talk to you today a little bit about freedom. Uh, we've heard this word used in so many different ways lately. Black Lives Matter, for instance, has demanded freedom from police brutality um, and ongoing systems of racism. Anti-mask protesters demand freedom to be able to do whatever they want and not wear masks and not physical distance. Um, just recently, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence um, said in a campaign rally, President Trump and I are going to keep fighting for faith, family, and freedom. Um, because, and you know, and that this last one actually really trumps me, no pun intended. Uh, because I wonder um, what exactly does the United States of America uh, want freedom fr from? Um, more on this uh, last one a, a little bit later. Uh, but really, what I'm wondering is what exactly is freedom? And do you think you are free? Um, I'm going to give you all a minute to think about this. And in the meantime, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, so I grew up in New Delhi, India, and you see as a child, all the phlegm I coughed out it used to be black. Yes, this is a TED talk on phlegm. I should have warned you things are about to get a little bit gross. Um, but um, you see, when I moved to Canada, I was only 10 years old. And after coming here, I was shocked because my phlegm was no longer black. It was actually white. Um, and I guess the reason behind this was um, Delhi it was and is uh, really ranks really high on on the level of pollution. Just last year, um, the pollution got so bad the government had to declare public health emergencies, shutting everything from schools down um, because it was not safe to be outside. Um, but I guess the reason I particularly was impacted a lot was because right in front of my home in Delhi, there used to be a coal power plant and day in, day out outside of our veranda, we used to be able to see these big, uh, tall smoke stacks, uh, that were just pumping out smoke at all times. Um, and I guess uh, it was just such a natural part of our environment. We never questioned why is there a big fat coal plant in front of our home? Um, why is our phlegm black? It was just, it, we just thought that was natural. Um, and I guess uh, going back to my question about freedom earlier, were my community members and me who went on, went on to accept this power plant and our black phlegm as just an everyday natural part of our landscape, were we really free when we were thinking those things? And so as I was doing research about this specific power plant in preparation for this talk, um, I found out it actually closed two years ago. Um, and the reason it closed was because it was one of the most polluting units in the entire country. Uh, as I got older, my family and me would often talk about how Canadian laws would never permit something like a coal plant that close to a residential housing complex uh, because, you know, Canadian laws were more just and more fair. Um, and this type of rhetoric helped us feel good about this decision to move to Canada. Uh, but um, as, as I do the work I do today, I pause and I think back, uh, were we really free when we were thinking in this way? Um, and the reason I do that is because the history and narrative of Canada, as most of us know it internationally, is one of benevolence. You know, we're the nice, kind, just, uh, peaceful, lawful people of the North. 
Uh, but as Desmond Cole wrote so poetically in his book, The Skin We're In, Canadians are so polite, we hesitate to brag about how well we have stolen this land. Um, Turtle Island, um, the land we more popularly know as North America, um, rightfully belongs to hundreds of sovereign um, uh, First Nation and Indigenous communities. Um, and for those of you who may not uh, fully know the meaning of this, a sovereign state is a state with a defined territory that administers um, its own government and is not subject or dependent to any other power. Um, so by this very definition, um, when indigenous uh, communities were sovereign, um, they the, the very creation of countries like Canada and USA on their land was not a humble founding of a great nation, but an act of invasion that devastated indigenous communities uh, that had been living here for thousands of years. Um, in Canada alone, for instance, indigenous peoples today only have control of just 0.2% of their land when uh, they once used to control 100% of it. Um, so when people like Mike Pence and Donald Trump are uh, campaigning for freedom, what exactly do they mean and whose freedom are they campaigning for? Um, going back to the example of my family and me um, and how we were comparing the quality of life in Canada with that of India's. Um, and, you know, we thought that Canada was so just because it would never build something like uh, a poisonous coal power plant right next to housing. Um, I want to highlight that in industrial pollution plagues more than half of all indigenous communities in Canada. Uh, Grassy Narrows First Nation is a popular example of this. It's located in uh, northeast of Kenora in Ontario and approximately 90% of Grassy Narrows residents suffer from mercury poisoning thanks to uh, Dryden Chemicals Limited uh, who dumped uh, mercury into the English Wabagoon River system between 1962 and 1970. The effects of the pollution are ongoing to this very day um, and they've also impacted White Dog First Nation. So Canadian laws are not as just as I once thought. Canadian laws selectively choose who should be cared for and justice for Black and Indigenous people is always the least of our priorities. Um, going back to my phlegm story though, that is exactly how systemic oppression works. Things like racism, capitalistic exploitation, and other social injustices are so pervasive that we have internalized these harmful systems to be normal. We have come to think of black phlegm and poisonous power plants as natural, acceptable parts of our world. We don't question why things like poisonous coal plants exist to begin with. So. How exactly are we free when we don't question the poisoning and destruction of both our bodies and the planet that we live on as an unnatural reality? Um, I don't think any of us can truly be free until we free ourselves from the notion that injustice and pain and suffering is natural. The very fact, for example, we have created things like Children's Aid Society to separate children from their families is not natural. Uh, Canada's child welfare system today has apprehended more Indigenous kids than at the heart of the residential school system. The very fact that we have a society that believes in surveillance over protection and punishment and prisons over precious human life, that should not be natural. Um, the fact that we allow uh, black and indigenous bodies to continue being disposed at the hands of state-sponsored murder and not hold their perpetrators to account should not be natural. Uh, we know that there is an incredible amount of poverty in our world. Almost 3.4 billion people live on less than $6 a day. Uh, Eight men, on the other hand, have as much wealth as the poorest half of the world. Uh, the incomes of the poorest 10% of people increased by less than $3 a year between 1998 and 2011, while the uh, incomes of the richest 1% increased 182 times as much. 
we don't have a money problem we have a lack we have a distribution of wealth problem but we don't question these things as an unnatural aspect of our world uh, before covid heart diseases and strokes were two of the largest uh, causes of death globally both of which are treatable illnesses but we don't question why are people dying of diseases we know the cures to the very fact that we feel um, guilty uh, for resting instead of constantly working, even if we're in the middle of a pandemic or experiencing so much pain, trauma, or challenging life realities, um, or the fact that we base our entire self-worth largely on how well we are doing in our careers, how is that an unnatural consequence of capitalistic exploitation that demands us to prioritize productivity at all times over health, happiness, and relationships. Um, so with all of this, I ask you to really consider, do you think you are free? To become free, you have to engage in the process of continually asking yourself and your mind uh, to work towards freedom a little more every day. Uh, but as black feminist uh, theorist Ruth Wilson Gilmore says, freedom is also a destination. Freedom is a place that is built on love. And when I say freedom is a place built on love, I'm not talking about the Hallmark package love you can buy for $10.99 on February 14th. Uh, when I define love, I'm relying on black feminist scholars like Bettina Love and Crystal Laura and so many others. Um, I'll specifically quote Bell Hooks here who said, love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another person's spiritual growth. Um, Hooks goes on to say, there can be no love without justice. Abuse and neglect negate love. Uh, care and affirmation, the opposite of abuse and humiliation are the foundation of love. And if we really uh, reflect on what Hooks is saying, we will realize without a firm belief in the promise of love and a firm commitment to acting for love, uh, none of us can free our minds. And if we can't even, um, if we, and if we aren't even able to free our minds of the very idea of injustice and pain and suffering as an unnatural aspect of our world, how will we ever be able to conceptualize a more just and peaceful world, much less create one? Thank you very much. Like many mixed race individuals, growing up, I struggled with my identity. In my mind, black was a bad word and I feared claiming it as my own. I wish to put as much distance between my black roots and my identity, hoping that the tie between the two would eventually snap. I wanted to be seen as a strong woman, but not too strong. I wanted people to hear my ideas, but not too loudly. I wanted to stand up for what I believed in but softly enough that no one would get offended. How could I not fear this part of my identity when even fame and achievement cannot protect influential black women from society's imposed stereotypes? When Serena Williams expressed her frustration during the US Open women's single final match, tabloids belittled her actions as a tantrum. When Michelle Obama was on her husband's campaign trail, her speeches were manipulated into an attitude problem. It appears that whenever black women show any negative emotion, they are dismissed as an angry black woman. Although this bigoted trope is rooted solely in racism and ignorance, I have a few ideas as to why black women might be angry. Black women might be angry because the gender gap is only the tip of the iceberg in regards to the hurdles they must overcome in the workplace. In the legal profession, 66% of black women have been excluded from networking opportunities compared to only 6% of their white female counterparts. Perhaps they're angry because they're frequently failed by the healthcare system due to discrimination from healthcare workers, as well as the erosion caused by the chronic stressors they face in daily life. In fact, black women are five times more likely to die during childbirth. Black women might be tired of the hypersexualization they face in the media. 
This translates into their dating life as it often prompts fetishized comments like, I've never been with a black girl or you look so exotic. Maybe black women are angry because the world seems to only care about black lives when they're being killed. It could be because of the many corporations who are treating Black Lives Matter as a trend or a way to prove that they're woke before educating themselves on the basis of the cause. Black women might be tired of the posts, the hashtags, the keeping in your thoughts and prayers followed by utter inaction. Their anger might be based on the observation that the world seems to only now be waking up to the reality black folk experience on a daily basis. Maybe their anger has been inherited from those who've come before them, furious that they are still forced to fight for their right to exist in this world. However, it could simply be because they're tired of swallowing their justified rage in fear of being discredited as sapphire. Quite frankly, maybe black women are pissed off that society is still asking why they're pissed off. Well, I can't speak on behalf of all black women, but I know that I'm angry because I'm paying attention. In a matter of weeks, our timelines were flooded with countless posts, petitions, and resources highlighting the injustices endured by the black community on a daily basis. If you're not angry about the current events, regardless of your race or your gender, you're part of the problem. That concludes the speaker's portion of our event today. We would like to extend our gratitude to the speakers who have taken their own time and effort to curate these amazing talks that hold an integral space in our community. They represent different groups at Queen's University who are dedicated to social justice and creating needed change in the world. These groups include Queen's Women of Color Collective, Queen's Collage Collectives, Queen's Asian Students Association, Q+, and Smith Black's Business Association. We would also like to extend our gratitude towards a group of faculty members and graduate students at the Faculty of Education who took the time to educate our own team on how best to cater the event towards the many different groups that were represented here today. We would also like to express our gratitude towards Queen's Student Diversity Project and Queen's Women of Color Collective who were involved in the early stages of our event planning, asked critical questions, and helped guide our event philosophy. Thank you to you all for listening to these speakers as well. Please take 50 minutes to stretch your legs, go to the bathroom, and reflect on the many ideas that were discussed today. After that, please come back to the same link to enjoy a panel discussion on some of the topics that were brought up uh, this afternoon. We're excited to see you back here very soon.
be discussing some of the questions here today. Um, I'm joined by four lovely. Um, so welcome back, everybody. Thank you for tuning into our panel discussion today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the last segment of our event and that you took away some meaningful points from our speakers videos. Um, so our team will be selecting some questions from our live chat. Uh, so if you do have any questions, please put them there and we will try to discuss them in our panel discussion today. So I'm joined by four lovely panelists who will now introduce themselves um, and share kind of their research and their work at Queens. So, yeah. So I'll start by introducing myself. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm pleased to be on this panel with uh, such amazing uh, colleagues here. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Um, I started in 2017. My name is uh, Alana Butler, and I'm in the Faculty of Education. My research and teaching focuses on at-risk children and youth. Um, more specifically, my work looks at how the intersections around social class and race impact educational opportunity. So um, from preschool level to post-secondary. So that's basically the focus of my research. I have various projects uh, that all address uh, either socioeconomic status uh, or, um, or race in some, uh, some area. So I, that is a focus of that. I also do um, a lot of community work uh, around this area too. So I'm very committed to the issues and very excited to participate in the panel today and looking forward to our discussion. So thank you again. Thanks, Alana. I think it's my turn. Um, I just wanted to thank the TEDx Queens U organizers for the invitation to engage in this discussion and calls to action on these important issues. I'm zooming in from beautiful Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory here in Kingston. And I just want to say how much I really loved hearing the students' perspectives um, in the last hour and appreciate all the efforts that went into this event and to share these ideas that I agree are worth spreading. Um, I am a white uh, scholar of, um, I'm a human geographer. I'm in the geography and planning department at Queens and I hold the Canada research chair in reconciling relations for health environments community, and communities. So as a white woman working in solidarity primarily with indigenous peoples across Canada, I just wanted to acknowledge that I found Brianna's remarks earlier today about allyship really resonated Julius's point about being on a constant learning journey, as am I, um, and Eileen's point about performative allyship and Akrita's story about environmental justice, like all of the talks this, this afternoon have really um, resonated with me. I've worked in um, uh, social justice, environmental racism and health equity for a long time now, I guess. Um, my, uh, I started out my academic career at Dalhousie University in the School for Resource and Environmental Studies. Uh, and I came to Queens uh, in 2014. Um, and I've been working, as I said, primarily on issues of justice, inclusion, um, uh, anti-Indigenous racism, um, Indigenous solidarity and autonomy, from a position of solidarity as a white scholar for the last uh, 20 so years, I guess. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I'm Karen Lawford. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Gender Studies. I am a registered midwife in Ontario. I don't work anymore as a midwife, don't deliver any more babies yet. Um, and I'm an Aboriginal midwife. So I was just actually uh, came back from visiting this weekend one of the elder midwives in the Basing First Nation. We had a great time. And I think that the student conversations that were shared through the, the YouTube, I really, really needed to hear that today. I can become re-energized um, and hopeful through my time with midwives and Aboriginal midwives especially but hearing the voice of students and your thoughts, I, I have hope. So thank you so much for being there and for sharing yourselves with us. It's deeply important and I thank you for this. Hi everybody. And I wanna thank everyone who organized this amazing event and all of the speakers. I'm so energized by what we're doing today. My name is Scott Morganson. I teach in the gender studies department at Queen's University. 
My pronouns are he and him, and I identify as a white queer cis man. I'm also a dual citizen of Canada and the United States, and I grew up in the state of California. Um, I am a white social researcher and organizer within LGBTQ plus communities. Um, my work has examined the politics of difference and solidarity, primarily within those communities, but also more broadly. Um, I focused on learning from histories of anti-racism and anti-colonialism within work for sexual and gender justice um, and and more broadly, both in uh, the Canadian and US national contexts and in transnational activism. Um, my, uh, my major work was primarily a, an ethnographic and historical study of white settler colonialism within LGBTQ plus spaces. And in that work, I was responding directly to the theories and the methods and the politics of indigenous two-spirit activists and allied cutie BIPOC activists who are challenging and transforming race, racial and colonial violence. So I, I try to teach courses that connect these various um, subjects. Um, I teach on the history of queer and trans politics, HIV AIDS movements, um, which I may have a chance to talk about in our discussion today. And I also teach about the history of ethnography. So I'm really happy to be here with you today. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Um, so I will be starting with uh, some questions about LGBTQ plus life. Um, so our first question is, what does LGBTQ plus life look around the world and how has the perception of LGBTQ plus changed over time in different countries? So I'd like to say that uh, I have a policy as a white cis man of never speaking first in these events. So I'm just letting all of my speaker, co-speakers know that I'm prepared to speak to the question. And if you'd like me to speak, I'd be happy to do that. But, um, um, I guess I can, I can do that a little bit, Scott. From what I'm hearing and reading um, is that there's um, more attention to the way two-spirit people are present and were present in indigenous communities at all across the world. So I'm just reading the question again. Is that, okay. So I was just in Guatemala in February, right before the pandemics was announced. I'm so grateful for that time. And we were meeting with Mayan midwives and the Comadronas and they, we got to meet a lot of leadership and understand their governance systems is quite complex. Um, it's not like, it's just really, really complex. What we, I specifically asked is where are your two spirit people? Where are your women leaders? And they were surprised that almost all of us who are visiting from Canada through Horizons of Friendship, which is located just west of uh, Kingston, is that we were almost all women. In fact, we were all women and only our helpers were men. And they couldn't really understand how we were so powerful and had such a strong voice, but also the confidence to, to say things and name things. And the women um, said that there's no such thing as two-spirit people, or, or if they are, they're very much encouraged not to be anything but, but straight. They also talked about patriarchy and colonialism, those two specific words as truly affecting their um, ways of being as Mayan people. So this is something that's starting. Um, so I see this as colonialism, as, as linked with heteronormativity, patriarchy, white supremacy, and of course, Christianity. These are extremely powerful tools, symbols, and ideologies that erase purposefully and destroy everyone. Um, I think we would all benefit from more, from more, from an expansiveness of identities. I think that hopefully would help Scott link into the conversation. It absolutely does. Thank you so much for those words, Karen, and for giving us this transnational global perspective and one that tells us about how indigenous people are making relationships across the colonial borders of these settler states. Um, I can speak to these questions from 
in the context of being a white participant in LGBTQ communities and politics in North America. Um, and what that means is that I've come out of communities that are normatively and predominantly white spaces, which are the spaces where I would help, where I came into being as an activist. Um, but I've also been acting as an accountable respondent to LGBTQ and two-spirit BIPOC communities and movements. Um, I think when I think about these questions, I often think about how we some we can perceive uh, the categories LGBTQ as um, as a kind of an identity or an aspect of of personal identity, as well as as a natural part of human existence and. And in fact, I understand them to be that way in some ways in my own life, and I know that many others do as well. Um, that argument in particular can be really compelling when one or when one's community is struggling against um, rejection uh, by family, religion, community, nation. Um, but when I talk about these top topics in a political or a space that's thinking about politics, I like to emphasize how once you gather this really diverse, potentially really diverse array of people who might identify as LGBTQ into an environment, it becomes really clear that we are coming from basically every community, every racial, ethnic, national, um, economic, um, you know, religious community from around the world. Now, whether everyone is there or not, they're either in the room or we are thinking about the possibility that they could be. And so the only ways that people can gather together in this kind of environment is by acknowledging our differences. Uh, I should say there are plenty of examples of movements that come together around these categories without acknowledging those differences, but they're there and we need to confront them. So I often like to switch the language of community in my talking about this to the language of solidarity. Um, it, when, it, when LGBTQ politics is working well, I think we're watching the politics of solidarity of people bonding together across their differences and finding a way to work um, productively together without collapsing those differences into a single experience. It becomes very clear pretty quickly that there's no one way to define the categories LGBTQ. Indigenous Two-Spirit people have been among the first to demonstrate that to us by making clear that Two-Spirit is not a category Category that can be folded into any of the other ones in our um, collective title. So I'll just leave it at that for now, but I like to uh, bring the discussion of LGBTQ politics to asking the question of how do you get people who are very different from one another, but who might uh, also find at least one thing to connect them to one another, how do you get them to work well in solidarity across their differences? How can we be accountable to one another's struggles and show up for each other? when others are experiencing a violence that we are not experiencing or that privileges us. I might just jump in. Oh, go ahead, Alana. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for your comments, Scott. They were very insightful and I look forward to a further discussion. Um, my comments, I just wanted to add uh, from uh, the perspective of intersectionality in terms of black individuals who may be um, also um, from the LGBT plus community. Um, it's uh, important to notice that by, around the world, there's still severe persecution in many countries. LGBTQ individuals are actually um, subject to um, prosecution, uh, in some extreme cases, uh, you know, being actually murdered in many countries. For instance, Human Rights Watch also records the fact that um, in 2020 alone, 30 black transgendered individuals in the United States have been murdered already. Um, so this kind of draws attention to the fact that there's disproportionate impact for certain groups and that we need to be mindful of that as well. So I just wanted to add that kind of perspective to um, what you so generously and you know insightfully shared, Scott. So thanks very much. And if I could just add in, you know, to echo all of the comments that I've heard so far, I, they really resonated with me. And, and to Karen's point earlier about the heteropatriarchy and heteronormativity and how those are very much linked to settler colonialism. And to Scott's point about coming together in solidarity from, you know, places of difference for sure. And that some of the techniques of settler colonialism are around divide and conquer. And that we need to work, um, I think, you know, to, to find those common threads. And I think that that's where in, in my work anyways, relationality and getting to know the whole person, not just, you know, the one hat that we might wear, like in, in this space right now that we're all profs at Queens, but we're, we, we are whole people and have 
ways to find common threads with each other. And the way to do that is um, spending time together in relationship with each other to find those ways of, of, um, of uh, reaching a, a point where we can engage in solidarity movements together. Great, thank you everybody. Um, and I guess to follow up, we do have a question from the floor that uh, extends onto what you've said, Dr. Castleton. Um, so as a white woman working on anti-Indigenous racism and solidarity with those communities, what can white settlers do to be better allies or uh, accomplices? Well, thank you for the question, Becca. Um, I actually was reflecting on that myself when I was listening to our earlier student speaker, and it made me think of a story um, that I'll share. One of them was even around this panel, actually, and whether or not I should be on it uh, as, a, as a white researcher. Um, and so I posed the question to the organizers, and, you know, the response was, you know, um, there's so I think that's a, the question is, am I taking up space when I don't need to? Um, and uh, to me, that's one, one example of it. But the, the other story that I thought I could share very quickly was um, just around um, a request to speak at, some, at, a, at, a, at a big event called um, the Best Brains event. I can't believe it's called that. It's so ridiculous. Um, but it's, I shouldn't say that, I'm being recorded. Um, but it's its organized through the Canadian Institutes of, of Health Research. My bad. Uh, but that's part of my personality is I, I, you know, sort of say it as it is. But basically, um, I was invited to speak uh, at this event um, about the impacts of mental health, or sorry, mental health and environmental impact assessment. And I thought, you know, that's an interesting panel, but who's on the panel? And they weren't disclosing who the members of the panel were. And I, and so I said, you know, I really need to know who's on the panel before I can agree to be on it as well. And, um, you know, long and short of it, uh, I basically, when I discovered who was on the panel, I said, I'd like to withdraw and create space for people who are more knowledgeable than I am who have lived experience that they can draw from. And after much back and forth, um, they brought one Indigenous panelist to the panel of, of four. And I wrote back again, and I think this is like where as allies, we have a responsibility to push. And I said, you know, um, I, I appreciate that you've done that. However, the appearance of just one indigenous person with a panel of three other white people really suggests tokenism. And I urge you to consider including a second indigenous panelist. I'm willing to give up my spot. Again, I kept saying, I'm willing to give up my spot in the interest of keeping to your timed agenda. I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm simply uncomfortable with being on a panel in 2020 that lacks robustness in terms of equity, inclusion, and diversity. Um, and in that instance as well, so the other panelists, you know, there was general agreement from the other panelists. Um, and in one case, the panelist indicated, well, as a white straight male, I, I fit the, um, the criteria by being an early career researcher. And I'm like, you've completely missed the point. And so, you know, third time, I'm like, I will withdraw. And, uh, and in the end, um, they did have, they did respond affirmatively, I guess, or positively to the feedback, but it was a real struggle because their responses, we have lots of Indigenous, Black, and people of colour uh, members in the audience. I'm like, that's, that's not good enough. You know, it's 2020, that's not good enough. And I think that's, an example that I hope um, resonates with you, um, uh, Becca, about how we can do better to be accomplices. So I'll leave it at that, thanks. Um, I do appreciate, Heather, that story. I think you might've, it doesn't matter. I, as an indigenous person, I hate being talked at by a, a panel of white men. I literally don't care what you think. I don't care, zero. If you are not, and, and me being in the audience, and that should be enough, like there's such a power imbalance there. It is just like, 
people need to really think about the power and privilege and authority that they presume by sitting in those places of authority. And it is the responsibility of um, conference organizers. Like if they say, well, that's the expert, like really think about the words you're using because how can uh, anyone be an expert if that's not their lived experience? And researching something within the academy is not a lived experience. This is our job. And I know that a lot of our jobs are, as academics, actually uh, relate to our personal interests. Um, but I'm really tired of panels of white men. And one of my friends, male, pale, and stale, that's how he calls himself. So yeah, give up your spot. So I'm actually interested in, in perhaps Alana has something to add to that. I'm going to hold my comments for a bit. I have a lot to say for the other two. So I'll hold in the interest of time. But thank you, Karen. All right, awesome. Um, so we also have another question from the floor. This one's from Maya. Um, so she says, it is really great to see a shift in mindfulness with people across the country. Um, but beyond awareness, what type of action needs to occur to begin the long trek to real and lasting change? All right, so I guess we'll ask Dr. Butler, do you have any comments on that? I think that we need to move. I think right now what, what we're seeing, and I, I really appreciate, Karen, what your comments were earlier. It is so important to also think of basically all critical movements around social identities, whether it's uh, looking at anti-Indigenous racism, anti-Black racism, um, looking at LGBTQ plus uh, rights and uh, all issues related to social identities that are marginalized in some way, is that the representation is important. And, and so this idea of, you know, nothing, nothing about us without us is so important. And I think we'd see that very critically. Um, I'm just, I just happen to be reading a book right now on decolonizing academia um, by Clelia Rodriguez. And it's just really a strong piece. And, you know, she talks about Linda Tui Smith saying, a, research is a dirty word. And it just resonated with me so deeply, just focusing on how it is that we look at communities and I think that we need to think about, you know, instead of doing things that are for other communities without consulting with them, without having representation from those communities, I think that's a really important thing. So I think we won't go anywhere when we have policymakers who are making decisions on behalf of marginalized and indigenous persons or, you know, oppressed individuals without those, the input from them. And we see this all the time. We see policies being developed uh, across the board without representation at all, or there'll be one token person, as you said, as somebody indicated, which the power imbalance often that tokenized individual doesn't have the power to speak because the other individuals in that committee could be you know, tenured per people who are um, a higher ranking and then that marginalized person feels afraid to speak. So I think that's, uh, it's really important to think about um, who is involved with making change. You know, the individuals who can speak best to the social identities as Karen was saying, that is, is critically important. The other piece is, we see this all over, institutions now are scrambling to issue anti-racism statements, um, systemic, it, it's, it's just blown up, right? I mean, I've been asked to contribute to some as well. And we need to move beyond statements, and we all know this, but this is very key. We will not get anywhere if we stay at the level of, oh, we've issued a statement, this is it, we're done. We want action. This is what we want, we want action. So I think that um, what we need to push for is for concrete action to follow up these statements because rhetoric is empty. Uh, Sarah Ahmed, uh, a, a wonderful scholar too, has also published extensively about drafting statements and diversity work and how it is all surface and we need to go beneath that. So I think that right now, I think people are just fed up. I know people of color who racialize my colleagues. My, my, I have a lot of I have sort of a larger community of racialized colleagues and we all say the same thing. We're just tired of seeing these statements. It's like, great, nice to have statements, but what are we doing? So I just like to say that. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> 
Can I add something, Caroline? Yeah, I appreciate um, your comments about those statements. And, and in the Department of Geography and Planning, one of the things that our a little collective of us came together with saying, we don't want to post just a statement. We need to have a statement and here's our first action. And our first action in our case was that our speaker series, which you know we run once a month, is that everybody this year um, and going forward, you know, we'll see how things progress. But for this year, at least, all of our speakers will be from the BIPOC communities um, as a, a way of saying, this is an action that we can do right now. And just to, to add to that, I also recognize that uh, my BIPOC colleagues are being asked to do this kind of thing all of the time um, because we're in a moment and the burden of those asks is huge. And so, there are certain ways that I've been reading about around how to recognize the contributions of these colleagues. And um, it's important for especially junior scholars to have these kinds of invitations show up on their, their CVs for getting academic positions and tenure and that kind of thing. But we can also acknowledge the time and effort that they put into that with providing an appropriate honoraria, for example. Um, we can um, give teaching release to our colleagues so that they can do the important community activist work that they do. There's so many ways. And, and then for the students on the call, I was thinking about um, one thing that you could do on the first day of class uh, if your professor doesn't acknowledge their syllabus, for example, is to say how many of the, re of, the, of the papers that we're reading in this course are written by BIPOC scholars, by LGBTQ two-spirit scholars, um, because I wanna know what they think. And you have a voice, this is an action that you could do in your classroom because us faculty were being asked to do that, but there's, uh, you know, like nobody's checking, if you know what I mean. So you can hold us to account and I really encourage you to do so. I just, when I think back to the question and thinking back to another question that's on the Google question list is I wonder how much we can actually change anything without a change in our governance structure. Because Queens has been started, I think, from a royal proclamation in 1841. So we're almost 200 years old. Gosh, isn't that homecoming going to be interesting? So how can we possibly make change at, in any institution, doesn't matter if it's Government of Canada or Queens, if we don't change the way we structure things, but we run the same, same, same process. And I ask this as someone who is a new um, faculty member at Queen's, as someone who sits on the Faculty of Arts and Science um, Equity EDII committee, and as a senator, what can I possibly do? I'm at every stage in this governance structure, but there can be no change because the structure doesn't change. So all of this work that is done, does it, can it ever make a change if the structure doesn't change? I've actually talked a lot. I'm gonna to try to shut it down for the rest because I wanna hear more from everyone else. <laughs> um, if Scott, you don't have anything to add. I, I probably do actually, but I, I just wanna affirm the leadership of our, my co-presenters on all the points that were made. And um, I'll speak more to these, uh, these issues as we continue with other questions. So we have more time for more questions. Okay, sure. So this one's from the floor for you, actually, Dr. Morrison. Um, so you mentioned that you make an effort to not be the first to speak in situations where the voices of others may be overlooked. Um, what led you to developing this practice and what other personal practices um, could people engage in um, in order to address their own privilege or assist others who may lack it? Thank you so much for that question, Sabina and, and Caroline, for presenting it to me and to us. Um, and I'm happy to answer it. And I'm really interested in hearing what my colleagues also think about how to answer this question. Um, I, I think I'll start by being uh, clear that everyone that engages, well, let's just say that I'll limit it to people that share my experience. So that uh, white people who are learning uh, about the power and the, the authority of our voice as Karen was speaking earlier with respect to the staffing of panels and leadership in the, in the academy, 
um, we often don't even become aware of how much power our voice holds or how much entitlement we have internalized to just speak our voice into spaces and expect that we and other people should hear the echo of the sound of our voice in our own until we've been called out on it. So I think that I don't think I've really fully even understood how much entitlement my white voice had until I put myself into the accountable relationships of social movements and activism as a young person and had to go through the experience of being checked and being able to, to really see on the face of the people who, who very unfortunately had to go through first the violence of being silenced by my voice and then the extra labor and effort, the emotional labor of having to check me and having to explain to me something that I could very well have learned on my own if I had been attentive to it beforehand. So, um, so for the, so I guess there's that, that's a deep historical answer to the question, but, um, but a, a, another example could be from the class I was teaching online just last week, where we're studying anti-racist and anti-colonial methodologies and gender studies and privileging the voices of black and indigenous and racialized women and two-spirit and LGBTQ people. Um, I, I found, uh, I, I went into the class, not so much with a super strict lesson plan, but more from the feel of how this works um, over the years of doing it. And, and I just set up the, the, the day by presenting, the, this is what we're going to be talking about and now I'm going to step back. And it would be really helpful if everyone who felt like they could speak would share. Um, and I'll facilitate when you ask me to do so, or which this is a class that can actually facilitate itself quite well because it has a lot of leadership in it by black and indigenous and racialized women and queer and trans people. And they just, anyway, the point is, is that they already knew the pedagogy to be able to create a, a class that would serve them and speak in their own voices and in their interests. I wasn't required. And I felt really uh, responsible at that point to my leadership role. Um, I am a tenured professor. I was hired into a very rare and, and uh, you know, lucrative uh, professorship in the Canadian Academy. Um, how do I work from within that power um, while also uh, to the extent that I'm occupying it, every moment that I am occupying it, trying to open that space up so that other voices are in leadership roles. So that, that conversation was an example of it. And, and frankly, they got way further on the material than I would have ever been able to imagine taking it. Um, my, my role as a speaker isn't as significant as my role as a listener most of the time I found. But I should end by saying that I am asked to speak and expected to speak when it's my responsibility to do so. And I'm ready to do that. Um, and sometimes I will even do it without being told to do so first. Awesome, thank you. Um, we mentioned at the beginning of our event as well that um, the basis for our theme actually came from seeing um, tensions, racial tensions and gender tensions escalate uh, alongside the pandemic. Um, so if you have insight into, you know, why have these social movements accelerated their fight for change in the past few months? Um, how is it related to our current pandemic and how are minority populations impacted differently from white populations? Well, I think um, I actually recently did a very brief piece for, for the CBC actually on the impact of COVID-19 on social inequality. And so we know that race uh, is one of the social determinants of health. And we see that with inequality that we see in our society that's structural, uh, social as well, uh, we see groups being disproportionately impacted. So we know that indigenous and uh, black individuals are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, which then further translates into education. Uh, there are huge gap, which is the, we heard about the digital divide, but it's even been exacerbated now by the pandemic. A lot of moves to online learning and education. Remember, I'm in education. So the move to online learning has not been smooth. Uh, so for individuals who are vulnerable at risk in some ways, isolated. So we have Northern Indigenous communities that don't have access to a lot of the technology that they need to per participate in online learning. And so that has impacted their access to education. And we can see this related to socioeconomic status as well. So for a lot of marginalized groups and, and, committee and communities, we can see that this has been a significant impact. In terms of social movements, we 
uh, I've every, everybody's seen the news and it's ongoing. We see ongoing social movements and it's not gonna stop. We are gonna see more, more and more movements uh, addressing the issue of anti-Indigenous racism and anti-Black racism. Uh, before we had the, I think there was a larger perception that it was a US issue. And I think now um, what I see this year that I'm, heart, I'm heartened by is the recognition that yes, it is in Canada as well. So we do see that um, just last week, there was an anti-Indigenous racist you know, um, incident that happened in a hospital, for instance, that was well rep uh, widely reported. We see in Canada, it's been 20 years of racial profiling uh, that has gone on, actually probably longer than that. But we can see that there's so much activism um, that we can see that has happened and that we, the social movements are really connected to a lot of these social identities. So hopefully there'll be more attention paid to the issue, but I really like the point that we make, we, that Heather made about education being important. Uh, so looking at how we can use our educational um, opportunities to kind of draw attention to these issues and raise more awareness is so important. Uh, myself, like whenever I teach a course, I always, I, I've always inherited syllabi and I'm always shocked by the, the erasure that I see in the syllabi. Like I'm just, I'm blown away by it. So I think it's really a really important point that Heather made that if you have professors who aren't looking at these issues or aren't taking up these topics, do challenge them. Um, you know, that, that has something that does make an impact because I have some colleagues who have come to me to say, hey, you know, I got a student evaluation saying my course didn't address these issues. What do Can you give me some suggestions or help? So I think students have a lot of power and a lot of voice to re hold us to be accountable to addressing a lot of these issues that we need to in the classroom if we're going to raise, uh, you know, produce individuals who are going to be very critical uh, and look at all these social issues that are going on and kind of take them up in whatever areas of work they end up going into to have that critical equity lens, which is so important for any line of work that you're in. That's kind of what I say to my students. It's like a pair of glasses that you have on that looks at equity. And so you look at who's being excluded by your choices. You know, how am I, how am I making decisions on behalf of individuals without consulting them? So just think about all those sorts of things. So I feel like a lot of the social movement needs to be addressed and how can we in our everyday practices dismantle anti you know, white supremacy, as well as anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism, as well as, um, you know, homophobia, you know, there are issues related to homophobia, Islamophobia, uh, anti-Semitism, we still see the, these issues going on. So how are you in a daily, on a daily basis, kind of working to dismantle some of these systems is the way that I try to get students to think. It's like the everyday little steps you take, little actions that you can take to kind of kind of poke a hole and hopefully the hole, <laughs> hopefully you poke enough holes that, you know, somehow this ship will sink or something. Nope. I don't know. <laughs> um, other, I'd like to hear other comments. I think I can speak to the question about the pandemic quickly by just mentioning that I happen to be teaching and we didn't plan it this way. Um, my course on the histories of HIV AIDS movements, which is a course on histories of community health activism this semester. And the students and I have been profoundly moved by seeing the relationships that we can draw historically and analytically between how the communities that were most affected by HIV AIDS, especially during the early epidemic, but still today because the HIV epidemic is not over as we know, or should remind ourselves constantly. Um, but the, the, the communities most affected by HIV and AIDS were most affected because of the particular intersection of multiple forms of oppression and social marginalization that they experienced that made them not only particularly vulnerable to HIV infection or to uh, poor health care, uh, uh, poor, poor health outcomes um, if they or their community members were infected, um, uh, but also they were subject to the ongoing systemic racism, sexism, homophobia, um, classism that their community was already being subjected to, which was now exacerbated by AIDS phobia. And we see how this is playing out in the context of racialized people, Black, Indigenous, and racialized people who are essential workers, 
um, who live within uh, communities and neighborhoods where a number of people are, are working in essential work areas or are unable to, um, to, to either bring their work home online, like people with you know, a, a role like mine or, or like a lot of folks in, in, in the academy are able to access. Um, and other layers that that these these various layers of social marginalization, as as Alana was just explaining to us so well, are are, are conditioning um, how people are being affected. So I've just given um, a little prompt to Caroline, but there are so many wonderful resources that we can go to to learn how um, HIV/AIDS activists going back into the 1980s already provided dynamically intersectional models of organizing across issues with. Kathy Cohen, who wrote the amazing book, The Boundaries of Blackness around AIDS and the politics of AIDS within black communities. She talked about the need to concentrate on cross, what she called cross-cutting issues to really get a, a better understanding of how disease intersects with social marginalization. And um, the, the book, Women, AIDS and Activism was published by the Women and AIDS Book Group from ACT UP New York in 1990. It's a book that's produced by white and racialized black and indigenous women by by people who are practicing, uh, who are in sex work, who are IV drug users, people who are representing all of the various um, forms of marginalization that, um, that the AIDS epidemic really highlighted. And I hope that by learning about how they managed under their conditions, that maybe students and all of us can learn better about how to approach the pandemic and its effects on people today. That's great, thank you. Um, so we are nearing the end of this session. So I'm just going to ask one more question from the floor. Um, so this is from Rachel. Um, and this is a very current question. So due to COVID-19 restrictions, not allowing us to show up in person for affected communities, how else can we make our support known? Is there anything we can do other than utilizing social media? Uh, I could speak to that real quick. Um, I think that uh, that we are in many instances still able to show up with appropriate social distancing measures in place, uh, you know, wearing a mask, etc. cetera. Um, but for those uh, events that are happening further away, um, there are, there's always a need for um, donations to support legal action when that's required. I'm thinking particularly of the Wet'suwet'en and um, some of the things they're facing as well as um, 1492 Land Back Lane. There's um, a day of action that's coming up on October 9th that you can participate in, engaging with your local communities uh, and the community organizations is another way that you can engage um, uh, maybe more so in person and, and reaching out to say, how can I be of assistance? I have these skills that um, I'd like to contribute to. And, um, and there was a, you know, a number of other ideas that I had, but uh, I'm sure my, my colleagues have others. I think um, you know, amplifying the voices of black people, indigenous peoples and people of color, uh, the LGBTQ two spirit plus communities uh, amplifying uh, their voices, um, speaking up when you're witnessing microaggressions or other uh, more overt uh, forms of racism, um, identifying institutional uh, inequities and disparities, whether it's in policies or practice. Those are the kinds of things that I think about. And, um, and to remember that this is an ongoing learning journey, I think can't be um, emphasized enough that, uh, that we're all working towards something, but we'll make mistakes along the way and, um, and to be prepared for that open and honest feedback, especially for those of us who are, who are um, trying to work in allyship, to be prepared for that um, positive and helpful critical criticism, if you will. Um, yes, thank you, Heather. I, I think um, one of the hardest things for me, it doesn't matter if we're social distancing or not, um, I think physical distancing, um, is that I wish people believed this, you know, when I say or anyone says, you know, that was a really terrible experience. I felt really isolated, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's the worst when, when I am bullied and people, 
either they dismiss me or they say, you know what? I was bullied too. I'm like, I literally don't care about you right now. Like I am mourning, I'm grieving, I'm fearful. My job is at, you know, like, honestly, I wish people would just sometimes just kind of shut up a little bit more and just say, you know what? I believe you like, and I do mean that, like, just stop talking about yourself for five minutes. Just say, you know what? I believe you. I'm sorry that happened. That's terrible. Like, you don't need to hear both sides of the story as if there's only ever two sides. Like, and also rid your mind of that dichotomous thinking. There's a lot going on in the, in all of our relationships. And we live in a, in a country that's racialized. We live in a country that's structured on violence like stop thinking that your experience is a universal experience of harmony and kumbaya we're not all of us have these good places so if someone comes to you and says i was treated poorly don't question and suggest that are you sure you know they just meant this they're so nice and they were wearing a pink jacket and pink's my favorite color in the world literally i don't care so just please believe people when they tell you, like I was thinking about um, the story, not the story, the horrible murder of the indigenous woman, the, the first nation woman in Quebec. If she hadn't filmed that, mm -hmm. would anyone have believed that that was possible? Oh, not our nurses, not our health care system. We have a statement. <laughs> it, I hope people are seeing all of the lies that can come forward even with all these affirmative words and kindnesses, it's the actions that we need to see. I feel really enraged and powerful, but I also am exhausted by having to do this work. So I need someone else to come in and say, you know what, how can I help? Is there something I can do? What can we do? And I had a group of students do that once. They're like, what can we do to help? You know what, ask for this because I can't do this, I'm a professor. Or they'll say, oh, you're just too sensitive, Karen. No, tell them. So there are things students can do. And I know that students are put in this position where they think that what they say doesn't mean anything, but literally I don't have a job unless they're students. So, and I need you and I love to be a professor. Like this is my dream job. I am just so incredibly happy doing this work and providing this service, but say what you want, stop being shy. And I am happy to move forward those conversations I don't have anything left to lose. My people have lost everything except for, you know, I don't want to put it in that negative thing, but I literally have nothing left to lose. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, if anyone else has anything to say, please unmute yourselves. Um, I just wanted to end by just saying like, um, first of all, thank you again, uh, Sabina, you, Caroline, uh, for organizing this and also to my uh, fantastic panelists. I, I've learned so much to, to, from just listening to each of you. I just want to say one of the things from the pandemic has been taking the opportunity to learn and read resources that are existing. Uh, being in the Faculty of Education, I've received many emails from not only students, but mostly schools and organizations saying, where are the anti-racism resources? We're looking for that. Well, those resources have been developed for 30 years. So take the time, actually find them because they're there. Like it's already been developed, like it's already there. So I think it's important to also take the time to kind of look at how you can find, uh, experience some learning. Like for instance, myself, I'm re reading a lot about what does it mean to decolonize education in a true sense from individuals who are indigenous writing about it, not settler people saying all oh, this, sprinkle this in the curriculum. There you go. There's a bit of indigeneity in there. Um, Karen's laughing. But yeah, I'm trying to read about what does it actually mean? What do I, as an educator, how does that shape my teaching? So for me, I think that um, I'd like us to take away continuing this, these dialogues in the spaces that you're in and also take the opportunity to learn. Um, you know, I realize I'm a, as a black uh, settler, uh, there's things I have to learn. You know, there's things about LGBT plus Q communities that I need, still need to learn and read about. Um, and I read, I need to still read about anti-oppression and decolonization. So for me, I think that 
my offer is to um, look for existing resources out there and take some time. I, I know we're all busy, but take some time to read and learn from, from individuals uh, who are from oppressed groups and find out how that can shape your own thinking and uh, your work practices and everyday sort of interactions. So I just wanna say that, thank you. Thank you all so much um, for joining our panel today and for you know, contributing such valuable insight um, into some of the questions that we discussed. Um, and thank you for answering our audience's questions as well. We have some more audience questions and we will try our best to address those as well. Um, so thank you to our uh, audience today who um, have been on this event uh, for the last two hours. Um, our goal to share ideas worth spreading would not be possible without your engagement either. And we sincerely hope that you're leaving with new lessons learned and, you know, as our panelists said, an appetite for more. Um, and we hope to see you soon at our virtual conference um, early in 2021. But yeah, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Um... Look up.